Octavian plays the game. War was not declared until more than six months later, but this final struggle for control of the Roman state actually began in that newly named month of July, 44 BC, when Octavian had celebrated the games in Julius Caesar's honor and Antony was consul. It was amazing what changes were to take place in a single year. Just one year and a month later, Octavian would have forced the Senate to give him, a mere boy of 19 years, the position of consul that highest place in the Roman state. Years later, he had forgotten, or chose to overlook, the fact that he had seized the consulship by force, but the fact remains. These are the events that led up to it. They are so many and took place so rapidly that we have to follow them like moves in a close game of wits. That is really what it was, a cruel, hard game of politics and war, a three-cornered game, to begin with, between Octavian, Antony, and Cicero who stood for the Republic. Month by month, move by move, this is what happened in that bitter struggle that followed the death of Julius Caesar. July, 44 BC. Antony, looking ahead six months to the end of his term as consul, got the Senate to decree that, for the following year, he should be governor of Cisplain Gaul. That arranged, he set the next Senate meeting for September 1st. Sextilis, Senators were gathering for the meeting. September, Cicero arrived in Rome, but when he found to his disgust that on the first day the Senate were to discuss divine rights for Julius Caesar, he sent word that he was too ill from his journey to attend. That infuriated Antony. Somebody ought to go, he said, break open his house and drag the old man out. That in turn made Cicero furious. Next day, dressed in his best toga, he came to the Senate chamber and launched at once upon the first of what were to be fourteen increasingly bitter orations against Antony. In reply, Antony publicly renounced his friendship with Cicero and all the other traitors and assassins. October, Antony was almost assassinated by Octavian, so he himself declared Men paid by Octavian to do what he said had been caught lurking in his vestibule, and he had barely escaped with his life. With that as an excuse for needing soldiers to protect him, Antony set out to take command of those legions of Caesars, which were still stationed at Brundisium. Octavian, hearing of this, set out for the country south of Rome, there to gather into an army for himself all of Caesar's retired soldiers, who might now have grown bored with farming. November. Octavian was back in Rome with 10,000 men. Marching to the Forum, he declared that he and his soldiers were there to defend the people and the Republic against Antony, who had proved to be a traitor. When Antony returned to Rome with his soldiers, the senators, in utter distress, ran back and forth between the two men, urging them to come to terms and not start another war. By this time, poor old Cicero, back home in the country, was also in a dilemma. Every day, he wrote Atticus, I have a letter from Octavian asking me to tape a cup his calls and to be a second time the savior of the Republic and to come to Rome at once. I am afraid to accept and ashamed to refuse. The boy was certainly acting with vigor, yet how could anyone be trusted who bore the name of that tyrant Julius Caesar? What to do, what a mix-up, what a dilemma to be in. December. Antony had now only one month left of his term as consul. He decided not to wait, but set out at once with his cavalry for Cispoline Gaul. To the old governor of the province, he sent word to clear out that he, the new governor, was coming. But Decimus, the governor, who was one of the conspirators, fortified himself in the town of Mutina and refused to move. Thereupon Antony laid siege to the town in order to starve him out. By this time, Cicero had arrived in Rome and sent word to Decimus to hold fast. Then, sweeping together his worst adjectives, he denounced Antony as a monster, a drunken swine, and a brute beast devoid of all sense and feeling. January. The two new consuls took office. 
Cicero, on his feet again, urged them and the Senate to declare war on Antony and to put their trust in Octavian. Cicero was now convinced that in this crisis the best thing for the Senate to do was to let Octavian help them defeat Antony and then settle with him later. I pledge my word to you, O Senate, cried Cicero, that Octavian will always be as loyal to the Republic as he is today. To you, to the Roman people, to the state, I pledge my word. The Senate was impressed, enough so to vote Octavian a seat in the Senate, but not enough to declare war on Antony. Not yet. Not until they had first sent a delegation to confer with him. At the same time, however, they sent Octavian and one of the consuls north with armies to scare Antony into reason. The delegation soon returned with the report that Antony was willing to trade his one year in Cisbaline Gaul for five years as governor of Gaul across the Alps. Cicero was alarmed. Beware, cried he, lest you let this foul and deadly beast escape. And finally he convinced the Senate that Antony was a dangerous man. February. On the second day, therefore, the Roman Senate formally declared war on Mark Antony. March. The second consul was sent north with soldiers to join the other consul and Octavian. Moving quickly, Antony tried to prevent their meeting, but ten days later the three armies of the Senate had joined. Storming Antony's camp, they gained a partial victory, but paid dearly for it with the lives of the two consuls, for both of them died that day. Antony, not knowing, of course, that they were dead and Octavian left alone in command, expected that the next day would bring another attack. So that night he broke camp and made a hasty escape. Thus the siege was raised, and Decimus and his soldiers, after four hungry months, regained their freedom. April. The glad news reached Rome. While with joy, the citizens cheered and applauded Cicero. They carried him in triumph to the capital and acclaimed him for a second time as savior of the state. It was Cicero's great day, the day he had longed hoped for. No special credit or thanks was given to Octavian, by either the Senate or Cicero for the part that he had played, and there they made a fatal mistake. May. Octavian was still in command of the army in Cisbaline Gaul when he received word that he had been voted the barest possible thanks for his part in the victory. Now that he had served his purpose, he saw that he was to be brushed aside by Cicero and the Senate. Very well, he thought, the time had come for him to make a move, and he thought up a shrewd one. The two consuls were now both dead, and there were still seven months left to finish out the year. He, Octavian, would demand to be made consul for those remaining months. He was nineteen only, much too young. The senators would certainly refuse, but if so, he would use that as an excuse to break off all connection with them. If they appointed him, what could be better? Either way, he was bound to win. June. A delegation of his soldiers went down to Rome to ask the Senate to appoint Octavian Consul. The Senators refused. July. The officers went down to Rome again. This time Octavian went with them, also a hundred men. Again the officer in charge demanded the appointment for Octavian, and again the Senators refused. The officer then pointed to his sword. This, said he, will make him Consul if you don't. That was a threat the Senate dared not disregard. Cicero was broken-hearted, utterly overcome with grief that this boy, whose loyalty to the Republic he had so confidently pledged, had after all followed in his great uncle's footsteps. He had marched on Rome and with force of arms defied the Roman Senate. Utterly overcome with grief, the old man, so recently flushed with victory, acknowledged his defeat and gave up the struggle. Sextilis, on the nineteenth day of this month, later to be known as August, Octavian was made consul of the Roman state. Nervous and sighed, but outwardly calm, he stepped forward for the first time to offer the customary sacrifices to Jupiter, with which the Senate meeting opened. In a circle about him stood the disgruntled senators, each one watching with a cold, critical eye for him to fumble. To their keen disappointment, he went through the service perfectly. It was likewise to their loss. It seems that they watched him so intently. For according to the story told years later, when myths had become mixed with history, if they had looked up that day, they would have seen twelve black vultures come sweeping down from heaven, those twelve black vultures of Romulus that had returned again. 
this time to circle above the head of the young man who was to become Rome's first emperor, the future Augustus Caesar.